I want to welcome everybody to Medagogy.com. I'm your host and your moderator, Dr. Lauren Brown. I'm a practitioner of Chinese medicine. I have a practice in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada called Acubalance Wellness Center or Acubalance.ca. And today I get to uh, moderate and host um, Pony Chung. Um, Pony is a practitioner um, in Toronto, Canada, on the central eastern part of Canada. And we have several courses by Pony on Prodi seminars, but I have to give you a little bit of history on Pony on his talk today on point drifting. Um, I saw Pony present at a conference in Toronto at Ames in 2013, and I was fascinated by it. And you're going to see today, you're going to see some really interesting videos on how Pony does his needling and um, how he kind of confirms point location. And what I really thought was fascinating, first of all, the video demonstrations blew me away. Um, two was how he was able to maintain the classical and bridge it with modern science and use kind of what we know today with cadaver work and modern science to basically confirm that the sages were brilliant and they really knew where the points were. And maybe now we're starting to drift with modern texts. We're starting to lose where some of those points are. So Pony's going to bring that all together. I'd like to give you a little introduction um, to the course today, this le lecture and on Pony as well. So basically, Pony's going to share numerous examples of point drifting to demonstrate classical authors had an amazing understanding of, it, of anatomy and were trying to pass down this knowledge to future generations. Pony will demonstrate using a case study how applying neural anatomical understanding to classical points results in focus and tension, better needle precision, leading to excellent clinical results. And just a little bit about Pony. Pony's an acupuncturist and herbalist. Um, and actually has a, an excellent herbal company for those in Canada called River Herbs, riverherbs.ca. Um, and basically, he decocts them from high quality herbs and he gets them in that pressure cooker. So you get them in the bags and he can ship them to you. So I know a lot of patients are liking that because they don't want to cook on their own. He's able to prepare them from high quality herbs, get them in a bag and then ship them off to you. So I just wanted to give that um, well-deserved plug to the pony because he's not only an excellent acupuncturist, he's an excellent herbalist as well. Um, Pony's passionate about demonstrating the parallel between classical and medical acupuncture. He's a continued education provider. He has several on Prodi seminars and has taught professional development events to both Eastern and Western health professionals. Pony has founded the Integrative Acupuncture Certificate Program at the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine, which, is, which focuses on the treatment of pain and nervous system disorders. Um, he's been invited speaker to the Asian Integrative Medical Symposium that happens annually in Toronto the Contemporary Medical Acupuncture Symposium, and also the American Academy of Medical Acupuncture Symposium. Just a quick um, reminder that today's lecture is for educational purposes. It's not meant to diagnose or treat. Um, if you have a health condition or concern, please do seek out um, a medical practitioner. Again, this is for educational purposes only. Please take a moment to read the disclaimer. Handouts are available on the Medagogy website, so feel free to download the handouts and this course as well as several other courses that we have. Always within a week after the live webinar, the recording goes up into the uh, Medagogy site and you have free access to that as well. If you stick around to the very end, we have a very, very special gift for you guys. So at the very end, we're going to turn off the recording and we got a special gift. So it's worthwhile to stick through to the very end. I'll be moderating your questions, so as you have thoughts or questions, please post them in the chat room. We will capture those, and at the end of the lecture, we'll um, bring those questions up to Pony. So without any further ado, I give my colleague and my friend, Pony Chung. Thanks, Lauren. Welcome, everybody. Um, um, today, what I would like to do is to give you a preview of uh, a larger program that I teach through ProD Webinar. Um, the topic of today's presentation is realigning modern point location to improve intentionality and therapeutic outcome. In acupuncture, we're always told that intention is number one. But, um, but uh, when I was a student at least, I wasn't exactly sure what intentionality meant. Um, hopefully, when I after I present this little introductory webinar, you'll have some idea of my interpretations of what international intentionality means and, uh, and from a humble opinion what the ancient sages uh, meant when they meant precise needling technique and, and having intention behind the needling. Also the, the title of the presentation is Realigning Modern Points. So what are we realigning it with? Okay. Uh, this is the, um, uh, my first slide explains 
the classical reference that I'm basing this realignment. It's, more, it's important to to uh, set the set the tone. What is it? I mean, when I'm talking about realigning, realigning with what? Okay. Well, what you're seeing here on this slide is the systematic classic Aikimax Bakshin. In Chinese, it's called Zhen Zhou Jia Yi Jing. Or in the, in the West, it has also been translated as the ABCs of acupuncture. This, this book is available from Blue Poppy in, in English. Now, this book was published by Huang Fumi. It's approximately the third century. And this is generally accepted as the first complete acupuncture manual. Right? Now, wait a minute. I thought, you know, Neijing and the Lingshu and the Su Wen is supposed to be the oldest. True, that they are the oldest. But the Neijing and the Lingshu and the Su Wen do not describe all the points that we know. Right? And they do not describe um, um, all the locations. Also, they do not describe uh, what channels they belong to and, uh, and, um, and uh, um, how deep to needle, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the reason why the systematic classic is generally considered the first and oldest um, complete acupuncture manual that is available to date. And maybe in the few years that we might unearth some other archaeological manuals, but for now, um, this is the oldest. And as it is in the traditional traditional Chinese medicine, older and more ancient texts are more revered. So that is the reason why I'm basing the uh, interpretations of uh, modern, acupunct uh, modern acupuncture points in relation to the systematic classic. And if we should find some subtle differences, then perhaps those differences are of importance today. Okay? Give you a little bit more introduction about the Jia Yi Jing. It's actually comprised of three volumes. So it's comprised of the Su and the Ling Shu that I already described. But it has a third volume called the called the Bright Hall Cavity Treatment Essentials, and this book is no longer um, in existence. So we have indirectly inherited this text through the Jia Yi Jing. Okay. The Jia Yi Jing describes the location of an additional 189 points that are that are not mentioned in the Neijing and Su and combined. Neijing and Su and com describe the location and the existence of 160 points. So in 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 total, we have um, the uh, the Jia Yi Jing described 349 because the Jia Yi Jing, as I mentioned, can uh, includes the the Su and, and the Ling Shu. Okay, so this is the reason why that. The Jia Yi Jing is important to um, the practice of uh, classical uh, acupuncture. Uh, if you were to speak to some Japanese lineage practitioners, um, their acupuncture point manual, if you will, is also the Jia Yi Jing. Some of the older traditions like to go back to the the um, locus classicus, if you will, academically is the original location of the of the information. So what I have done in my research is that I've compared. First of all, I translated. The, the point location of all 349 points from the Jia and Jing, from the Chinese to the English. Okay. Then what I did was I did some cross-referencing, relying only on peer-reviewed journals, preferably those published within the last 10 years. Why? Because in, it is the, it is the, um, it is the uh, point of view of Western medicine that more current research is more relevant, whereas in Chinese medicine, the more ancient classics is more relevant. So I try to respect both. So when it, when it comes to cross-referencing Western medical literature, whenever possible, uh, using sources within the last 10 years. Also, when, whenever information wasn't available, because you would think that anatomy is the open and, open and closed topic, but it's not. There's a lot of information which I still don't know about anatomy. In fact, in my research, I have found a lot of anatomy textbooks are actually imprecise. And in those situations, I've actually had to learn how to do some cadaver dissections, and you'll see some very exciting acupuncture point dissection images that I've done. Uh, I'm happy to share those with you. And um, so to make a long story short, basically I look at the location in the classic, I look at what it is in, in modern anatomy, whether from peer reviewed sources or from my own dissections, and try to see what lies deep to the, to the needle tip. What is it that the ancient acupuncturists were possibly trying to stimulate? And, um, and, um, and uh, uh, in doing so, I've quote unquote decoded um, the targets for the 349 points, and uh, broken, broken them down into either sensory nerve targets, 
motor nerve targets or specific muscles or autonomic nerve targets, so on and so forth. Then from there, it was a matter to a lot of testing and experimentation to see if these targets can be um, precisely needled. And uh, because uh, we, uh, we know the anatomy, if it is a sensory nerve target, we expect to feel cer certain electrical sensation consistent with the dermatome of those points. If it's a motor nerve, then we expect to see a reproducible range of movement as a result of the stimulation of the muscles that are innervated by that motor nerve. We know what the range of motion of certain muscles are, expansion, flexion, et cetera, um, et cetera. And then finally be able to uh, demonstrate uh, this technique by transferring this technique to others. To, to show that this is actually a reproducible technique. The first one I would like to begin with is to take a look at kidney 3. On the top left corner, we have the location of kidney 3 according to manual of acupuncture, so a la Demon and Alkafaji. Um, the location is, is, uh, is uh, familiar to all of us. It says it's in a depression between the medial malleolus and the Achilles tendon, level with the prominence of the medial malleolus. Now let's take a look at the location described by the Jai Jing, okay? And the, the, which is a systematic classic. So if you look in my notes over here, what I, where my green arrow is pointing to, I'm pointing to systematic classics. It says that kidney 3 is the earth island point. It's in the depression of the pulsating vessel behind the inner ankle bone, above the heel bone, where the fusion vessel, etc., etc., etc. Notice that I've um, highlighted in red, pulsating vessel. Okay, and the character for the pulsating vessel is over here in Chinese. Dong Mai is moving, moving vessel. Okay, so this is information that seemingly has been lost in the modern, modern um, uh, inherited version of this point. Okay, now let's take a look at the anatomy of this point and see if we can make sense of what this pulsating vessel could be. In this picture here in the bottom left corner, you're looking, you're looking at the medial aspect of the ankle. Where the green arrow is pointed to is the medial malleolus. And uh, posterior to that, you have a neurovascular bundle called the tibial nerve and tibial artery. Okay, so obviously in red is the, is the artery and in yellow is the nerve. Okay, so kidney 3 will place it about over here. And evidently, according to the ancient sages, in order to locate kidney 3, one has to feel the pulsating vessel. By feeling the pulsating vessel, in my humble opinion, places you right adjacent to the nerve, which is the posterior tibial artery. And if you, if you just put the needle um, right beside the, the pulsation, you would then fall right on the, the, um, the trunk of the posterior tibial nerve. Okay. Let's take a look at what happens when we uh, use this level of precision to our needling and then electrically stimulating that. Okay. So for in this um, slide here, I'm going to demonstrate to you what happens when we electric electrically stimulate a needle that has been inserted in kidney 3. Okay. Now in this particular um, picture, uh, I've put the needle in a more um, uh, posterior anterior orientation. Um, mainly because it's easier to see on camera. If it was actually perpendicular to the screen, um, as you most people would needle it, it's actually hard to see the needle from the um, from the head of the needle. Okay, so let's do a little quick anatomy review here. The posterior posterior tibial nerve innervates that ultimately becomes the medial plantar nerve and the lateral plantar nerve. These are the nerves that, in addition to providing providing sens sensation to the entire sole of the foot also provides um, flexion of the toes, of, the, of, the, um, of, uh, of, of all the toes, of, of the intrinsic muscles of the feet. So if you take a look, once we electrically stimulate that, just a second for the video to load, we get a very clean, okay, very, very clean flexion of the intrinsic mu muscles, flexors of the toe. Okay? And this is how it is possible for us to confirm our needle precision. Whether it is you're using this to um, treat a um, rock climber who uses their toes a lot more or a dancer than the average athlete, or you want interesting and tonified sheep by stimulating kidney three, 
this is a nice way to confirm that you really have the right dirty sensation. In fact, for the right dirty sensation for this point could be any of the uh, um, neurological um, 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 uh, relevance that I described, such as the electrical feeling or, or, or um, paresthesia in the bottom of the foot, the dermatome, or slight twitching of the big toes, slight twitching of the rest of the toes would confirm that you have the right dirty sensation for that point. Of course, you can always use this pointer plus device to stimulate it, and then it can show it can, it is a quick way to verify it. Okay, so a quick word about the pointer plus device. The pointer plus device is diver delivering 10 hertz of electrical stimulation. And um, so in addition to being a, a device that can be used to locate points, it's, it, it's actually a treatment device also. And um, so by sending electricity through the tip of the needle, which goes into the posterior tibial nerve, we're able to recruit all its downstream neurological um, deriv derivatives, which are the medial calcaneal nerve, the lateral plantar nerve, and the medial plantar nerve, and all the muscle targets that those nerves, um, and also all the dermat dermatomal targets that those nerves innervate. Let's play that video one more time for everybody to take a look. Now let's move on to the next slide. Another two points that I would like to take a look at is liver 8 and kidney 10. And um, as you know, um, depending on which acupuncturist you ask and uh, which day of the week, liver 8 could be above the knee or below the knee, right? It's one of the points that uh, acupuncturists just can't seem to get along with. Um, this is uh, the modern uh, anatomical location for liver 8 and kidney 10. Um, I won't go into too much detail because we all know where they are, but uh, I thought it would be interesting to compare it with what the, the classic says. This, what you're looking at here um, is still considered modern location. Uh, these locations are word for word. Um, verbatim from Chinese acupuncture moxibustion, uh, also known as CAM, by Chen Xinong. And, um, and uh, so I'll just read a quick passage as an example. Um, kidney 10, a uh, modern location, tells us that when the knee is flexed, the point is on the medial side of the popliteal fossa between the tendons of the muscle semitendinosus semi and semimembranosus at the level of, at the, at the level where you be 40. We all know this, okay? Now, let's take a look at what the classic would have said. Obviously, ancient times, there was no, you know, 2,000 years ago, or perhaps 3,000 years ago in ancient China, they didn't call it semitendinosus and semimembranosus. What did they call it? Okay. And, um, and so somebody made the decision from the classics to interpret certain muscles that are described in the classic as semitendinosus, as semimembranosus. I, I like to play devil's advocate and, and show you how some of these interpretations might be close, but no cigar. When you look at the classic, now, now these are the classic locations based on the spiritual pivot. Okay? So if you look at kidney 10 here, again, where the green arrow is pointed to. Chapter 2 of the Ling Shu, spiritual pivot, says that kidney 10 is located behind the secondary bone, below the large muscle, above the small muscle, located by pressing, obtained with the knee bend. It's a Hussey point. Okay, so clearly no mention of semitendinosus, semimembranosus. All they talk about is a large muscle, a small muscle. Okay? So it is anybody's interpretation where that point is. Okay, but presumably the ancient authors wanted to help the, the next generation locate this information and learn this information easily. So one would think that the authors used information that was easy and intuitive to understand. Okay? The picture here you're looking at in the center of the slide here is taken from. Uh, the Journal of Arthrosco Arthroscopic and Related Surgery. This is a paper published in 2005. They were interested in the pathway of the saphenous nerve. Okay. And um, this is the median view of the knee, uh, just to help orientate everyone. The patella is over here. Okay. So this muscle coming down here is the sartorius muscle. Uh, you're looking at the femur, medial condyle uh, of the femur. And in dashed line over here, this is the femur itself. And um, um, if you were to look at the medial aspect of the knee, okay, it should be readily apparent that the largest muscle in this, in, this, in this medial neighborhood of the knee is actually the sartorius muscle right over here, as, as the line indicates. Okay? 
because the gracilis and, and the semitendinosus, semitendinosus are pretty similar. And if the ancient authors are trying to pass on certain information by telling you that the points are located between a large muscle and a small muscle, it makes sense to me that they would tell, um, be referring to the most obvious large muscle. And one look at this slide, you would know that the largest muscle is a semi, is the sartorius, which begs the question, could it be that kidney 10 is located between the sartorius and the gracilis? Here's a big muscle, and then right next to it is the gracilis, as indicated by this, this uh, labeling over here. Okay. And in, the, in, in fact, not semitendinosus and semimembranosus. Okay. Now, of course, it's interesting, right? This is, anybody can uh, speculate this. But what if deep beneath um, the, the, uh, where the sartorius and the gracilis meets, we actually have a nerve? Whereas between semitendinosus and semimembranosus, the, uh, the modern location, there's nothing neurologically exciting there. Then it further points to the possibility that perhaps between sartorius and, and gracilis is more of a neurological, potentially um, uh, powerful point. Okay? If you look, if I can draw your attention to what's labeled as a saphenous nerve on this slide, saphenous nerve is creeping down here behind the sartorius, okay? Then it divides, it bifurcates, medically speaking, into what's called the infrapatellar branch, because it's under the patella, hence the name infrapatellar, and what's called the sartorial branch, it continues further down the leg. We've all had the experience of needling or being needled at spleen 9 to feel that zing that going down the leg. That zing that goes down the leg is, uh, you can thank the sartorial branch of the saphenous nerve for that. Okay? This, as so happens, the sartorial branch of the saphenous nerve exits the fascia right between the um, sartorius and the gracilis. Okay, as you can see over here, so this is this, this, this sartorial branch over here, and it's, it's, always, it's a dot, dot, dot line, and then comes out right between these two. This would satisfy what the kidney ten location from the Ling Shu is behind the secondary bone. So I should mention what secondary bone means. It is common in Chinese classics to refer to uh, anything that is sec uh, assistant or secondary or supporting, okay? Uh, relative to something that's more important as the dominant. So the dominant bone in the knee would be the kneecap, whereas the secondary or assistant bo bones of the knee would be the, would be the lateral or medial condyles, okay? So talking is behind the condyle, okay? So looking at the, this green dot over here, if we were to put it behind the condyle, we're still right there, um, below the large muscle, above the smart above the small muscle. So we're below the um, sartorius, but we're above the gracilis. This still satisfies with the exact location as described by the, uh, by the uh, Ling Shu. Okay? And uh, now let's take a look at liver 8. Liver 8 says that it's below the secondary bone, above the large muscle. Okay? So if we say that this is the secondary bone, we put a Put in here in this green point here below the condyle, okay, and it has to be above the large muscle. So see how the sartorius curves around here. This point here is still above the large muscle. Guess what? This point is the infrapatellar branch of the saphenous nerve. Okay, so suddenly we have very precise neurological targets of interest when we properly in. Um, integrate the, the interpretations from the classic and modern um, neuroanatomical understanding. Okay? So just to help answer that question I started, where in the heck is liver 8? Well, if liver 8 is the infrapatellar branch of the saphenous nerve, okay, as long as you are stimulating this branch, okay, you can put it at the joint line, you can put it below, you can put it above, is correct. And as I'm sure there's no surprise, everybody claims that their location is correct. Well, every, everybody's correct. At the end of the day, everybody's correct. But as long as you are actually, your intention is that you're actually stimulating this proper branch, then that's the right in intentionality for that point. Okay. Um, these next two slides is just more uh, uh, more detailed explanation of what I just talked about. Okay? So um, along with some anatomical uh, peer review sources and, um, and um, also uh, my line of thinking. So 
I, I won't go into that with too much detail. That I'm gonna leave. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave this to um, to you guys to to read at your own leisure. And this is um, the quote unquote proof um, of uh, what I said. This is a dissection that I performed um, a year ago. And uh, what you're looking at to help orientate everyone, again, is the medial aspect of the knee, okay? And, um, and uh, this largest muscle we already mentioned is the sartorius. The muscle next to it, the tendon of the muscle next to it is the gracilis. And highlighted in uh, th broken dotted lines is where the sartorial branch, okay, uh, sorry, where the saphenous nerve exits the fascia to then go into what's called the sartorial branch or the infrapatellar branch, okay? So in green, as in color-coded here, okay, liver eight here in green, location of liver eight is the infrapatellar branch, whereas the kidney 10 is where these branches first exit the fascia, okay? And um, as you can see, I've uh, uh, purposely um, raise the nerves with um, uh, acupuncture needle flags. So hopefully uh, it'll be a sort of an inside joke for acupuncturists. Next one, okay. Signs out the small intestine 13. Okay, let's, again, always start with the modern locations. Small intestine 13, according to many of acupuncture, is located on the medial extremity of the suprascapular fossa, okay, so the suprascapular fossa is, ab is above the spinal scapula on the medial extremity, okay, also known as the vertebral border, about midway between spinal intestine 10 and the spinous process of the second th thoracic vertebrae, okay, so spinous process and, and um, spinal intestine 10, about halfway in between. This is the modern location. Now let's we'll see what the um, what the uh, systematic classic says. Okay, the systematic classic m makes reference of a pulsating vessel. Okay, so um, unfortunately we didn't learn in school to to locate small intestine 13 by palpating a pulsating vessel. This information is sadly lost. Um, I'm not trying to blame any, anybody, but um, it's good to. Always, um, it's all. It's you know, it, it is a tradition in Chinese medicine that older is more revered and better. So that's why I think the information about systematic classic is was worthy of our intention. It says here that the location, the point, small intestine 13, is in the depression at the center of the bend of the shoulder blade, where a pulsating vessel is felt by pressing. Okay, so what could possibly be the center of the bend of the shoulder blade? If you look at this picture here on the bottom right, there's an angle over here where the spine of the scapula meets the vertebral border. This is still this is still angle here. But I don't know the anatomical name for this angle, but this to me satisfies the the um, the, the terminology here is at the bend, at, at the center of the bend of the shoulder blade, where there's a pulsating vessel. Okay, the the nearest pulsating vessel that we can have that satisfies this bend of the shoulder blade is another neurovascular bundle called the dorsal scapular nerve and artery. And um, what the dorsal scapular nerve and artery innervates are the rhomboids, minor and major. Okay? So it would appear that small intestine 13 is not on the scapula. It's medial and off the scapula at the bend of the scapula where a pulsating vessel could be felt. So I'm thinking that this is actually um, ancients knew about this, this nerve and was trying to stimulate the nerves that innervate the rhomboids, in this case the dorsal scapular nerve. Let's take a look at um, an example of how to stimulate the dorsal scapular nerve. Okay, um, this this point here, I'm not stimulating. I'm not stimulating dorsal scapular nerve directly from small intestine um, 13. And the important thing is understanding the intention. If you understand the intention is to stimulate the dorsal scapular nerve, then you should be able to rely on your understanding of an anatomy and stimulate it anywhere and still get the same effect. What you're looking up here is a page is a peer review journal published in 2005, they were looking at the, the surgical anatomy of the dorsal scapular nerve. And this picture here is sort of a dorsal view. So if you see here, this is somebody's cervical spine, okay? This is the levator scapula, and this is the scapula itself. So the levator scapula is attaching to the superior corner of the scapula. And 
these two little muscles here, these are the mid and posterior scalene. So this dorsal scapular nerve actually uh, peeps through between the dorsal and, and um, sorry, the medial and posterior um, scalene. After it exits there, then it goes into innervate the rhomboid muscles. It actually sends a little branch to the liver scapula itself. Okay, so this is why in this picture here you see me needle the person's neck. I'm actually putting the needle between the middle and posterior scalene. Um, it is easier to find the nerve here than it is to find the nerve um, at at the um, at the medial border, medial uh, bend, central bend of the scapula at this right. But as long as you understand the intention, you should be able to know when it's okay to break the rules. So let's bring in the video for the stimulation of the dorsal scapular nerve, the original intention, if you will, behind small intestine 13, according to the systematic classic. Okay, so what you're going to see is a very clear retraction of the scapula once that uh, once the video loads and we apply 10 hertz stimulation to this to that needle over the dorsal scapular nerve, then we should see a uh, clear retraction. There we go. So the entire scapula is moving moving towards the midline. Um, seems to me the video is um, uh, not not playing very smoothly. Okay, but um, we we'll give it a couple more times. There you go. You can see that the entire scapula is moving towards the midline. Play that again. There you go. Okay, so. Example of how to reconciliate anatomy and classical point locations to enhance one's intention. Let's move on to the next point. Okay, now let's look at the points long one and long two. Okay, according to modern point location, and by modern I mean either CAM, uh, Chen Xinong, or many of acupuncture, Demon, and Alkafaji, long one location is as follows. It is located on the lateral aspect of the chest in the first intercostal space, six swing lateral to the midline. Long two is approximately one swing uh, uh, inferior and lateral. Uh, sorry, long, long one is approximately uh, one swing inferior and lateral to long two. Okay? No mention of any type of pulsating vessel that we're going to see described from the classics. Okay, so without going into too much detail, okay, systematic classic says that for long two, this point is, lo is located below the great bone, which is this case of the cavicle in a depression to some uh, besides stomach 13, where a pulsating vessel is felt. Okay, so again, long one, they, again, they talk about a pulsating vessel. Okay, so these are in red here, the Chinese character for the pulsating vessel. Let's look at the anatomy and see what could possibly be a pulsating vessel that would be uh, detectable by a palpation therapist. The acupuncture presumably was, was a heavily palpation oriented. So let's think like an ancient practitioner. If they were doing this by palpation, there has got to be a pulse that we could feel. And what was the pulse that would be near this, this area, this the delta pectoral triangle area, that uh, would it be the pulsing vessel that ancient authors are trying to tell the next generation? If you take a look at the picture here on the bottom right, it's a very, very exciting paper. It just came out in 2012. Okay? They were trying to, they were trying, this is actually a paper trying to understand um, the sense the nerves that are um, uh, around the chest because um, uh, uh, people that do breast related surgeries, either mastectomy or breast augmentations, um, don't want to accidentally cut nerves that, did, that can result in pain and, and paresthesia um, for, for, the, for the patient. So there was a need to really understand the neuroanatomy of this area. And uh, what you can see in this picture here, okay, is, uh, first of all, these pictures are actually based on uh, that cadaver drawing, cadavers uh, photos, and then they, they, they took an artist to draw from the photo itself. So these are actually correct drawings, not some artist um, artistic uh, rendition. The, pul the pulsation that is in this neighborhood, um, okay, the pulsation that's in this neighborhood is the 
absolutely artery. So it's actually just the same thing as the subclavian artery. Subclavian artery on the other side of the clavicle, so subclavian, once below the, 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 um, the clavicle is called the axillary artery. And look at the, the branches that are in this area. Okay, this SB here, um, uh, uh, if you look at the uh, legend over here, stands for the superior branch. And the MB here stands for the medial branch. Okay, so both of these branches and nerves are in the neighborhood of a pulsating vessel that's detectable. And each one of these innervate a different uh, fibrous part of the pectoral. Of the, of the pectoral loss major. This is just, um, when I discovered this, this, is so exciting. I was happy for, you know, I couldn't sleep for two days after I disco discovered this. How did they know this? Okay, clearly, they were trying to pass down lung one and lung two as specific branches okay, of the uh, pectoral nerve. In this case, okay, in this case, uh, these authors uh, recommend no longer calling them medial or, or, or uh, lateral pectoral nerve as is the, as is the convention uh, today, they recommend calling them superior and middle branches. Okay, so for lack of a better word, superior branch of the pectoral nerve is lung, uh, lung, um, uh, uh, lung one, and um, and uh, middle branch is lung two. Let's take a look at the video of what happens when we stimulate that. Okay, so. Two points, needle exactly in lung one and lung two location. And what I'd like you to do is to try to direct your attention to the way that it is moving the, uh, the, uh, uh, um, the chest, okay? You'll be able to see that it moves the, sh the chest in different directions. In, in fact, you can see that the different muscle fibers being engaged. The, the top needle there is, is engaging the cavicular fibers of the pec major, whereas the uh, needle below okay, is engaging the sternal fiber of the pec major. So it gives you completely different type of pec movement. Uh, so it turns out that these two lung one and lung two points are specific points to stimulate specific branches okay, of nerves that innervate the pec. Okay. Just play this one more time and then we'll move on to the next slide. So hopefully I'm starting to paint an idea that is palpation is important and this is passed down from the classics. And unfortunately some of the palpation information mm -hmm. about pulsations is lost. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um and and um and um, um by understanding the anatomy it helps to actually improve our intentionality. I, I think, in fact, ancient acupuncture would master anatomists. Okay, let's move on to the next slide, please. Tony, we're just at the 30-minute mark, just to let you know, okay? Yeah, okay. I'm going to pick it up a little faster. I think people are starting to understand um, the, the type of research, so I'm not going to go into as much um, description of location because it presumably we all pass our license exams. We all know where the points are anyways, okay? Stomach five. Modern location does not mention anything about a pulsating vessel. But if we move on to the next slide here, stomach five from the systematic classic, again, talks about a pulsating vessel. So what, could the, what is the top of a pulsating vessel in this region of the face? It is none other than a facial artery. And as you can see in this picture here on the bottom right, the facial artery and vein is clustering with a particular branch of the facial nerve. This is called the marginal mandibular branch of the facial nerve. It is responsible for a depression movement of the lips. Okay. So if we can um, bring the video for this point, stomach five, please. In this video, uh, because this nerve is so superficial, you don't even need to needle it. I'm directly stimulating that nerve through my skin. And um, you can see it makes you look really cold and shivery, okay? Because it is engaging that part of the facial nerve that is responsible for pulling down the lower corner. So somebody has Bell's palsy or facial nerve palsy and has a drooping or cannot keep air in the lips, that's because this particular branch of the facial nerve has been affected. It is a very valuable 
uh, technique to have to be able to palpate the pulse, put the needle beside the pulse that tells you that you're exactly on that branch, test the pointer plus device to confirm that you have the right nerve, and then at that point, you connect it to your alligator clips and e-stim device, and you give them a nice, gentle electrical stimulation to reawaken that nerve. Okay, one more time, and move on. Okay, next slide, please. What I would like to show you is an example of how this can be used uh, in ways other than facial nerve palsy. So I, I'm showing you a picture, of a video here of a Parkinson uh, gentleman. And uh, as you know, Parkinson is a um, uh, tremor-related neurological condition and usually affects the gait, okay, it affects the neck and stuff. But in this particular gentleman, is affecting his lips. And so um, I was treating various scalp acupuncture techniques and getting, getting pretty good results, okay, but I wasn't able to get rid of this this aspect. So I, so, I, so I remember, oh, you know what, maybe I can try stomach five. According to my interpretation of stomach five, it's the marginal manipulative branch. That is the nerve that's responsible for this. Maybe if I stimulate that, I can create some kind of central effect through peripheral stimulation, and we'll see what happens, right? Nothing to lose. So if I can bring the videos here to show the before and after. So what we're seeing here is the before, video to catch it before the treatment, and after as in immediately after that that treatment, so 30 minutes after that treatment. So very noticeable, um, the video is in the loop, okay, it's very noticeable um, kind of a gyration and pulsation in this area. Okay, he's just shaking. Okay, that's not the hand shaking uh, the, of the camera hand shaking. That's the actual person's skin shaking. Right. right, and so I put a needle in there, electrically stimulated it um, by hooking up to an e-stim device, okay. and then right after the treatment, it, it really calmed down. Uh, let's have the next video, please. Now, of course, this is not a. It's not a sustained. It's not a sustained result, okay? Um, more, more, more treatments are needed, combining with what you know about uh, scalp acupuncture and so on. But it's very good for building patients' confidence that they are actually able to get a immediate noticeable change. So the video is playing, okay? And the, the level of shaking that's going on in the um, in the uh, in the uh, uh, lower chin jaw area is significantly reduced. Yeah, if there's a way for us to play these side by side, that would be ideal. But that's, that's, what we're, that's what we're going to try and do. Let's see if we can uh, yeah, yeah. experiment here yeah. for a second. Yeah. Yeah. Again, thanks for putting this all together, Pony. It's, I love the videos. I mean, just this is what I fell in love with your teaching when I saw you teach when you brought this I was just like, wow, this is amazing. And I'll remind everybody yeah, so that Tony bottom, does have communication courses on Prodi. So this stuff's amazing. So on the bottom is, um, is, uh, is, is the before acupuncture treatment, very noticeable shaking, right? And then the, the top one here, um, it's loading, right? I think we can all see that it's a significant reduction. I mean significant, not to the practitioner, but the patient can perceive this. Okay. Good. Let's um, move on to the next slide and I'd like to get in a, a case study in there. Okay. Uh, one more point. Uh, Sanjiao Ten. Uh, Sanjiao Ten um, we modern books located behind the olecranon. So I'm going to just direct your attention to the very bottom of the slide here. This is the fundamental Chinese acupuncture. That's the um, that's from uh, Alison Wiseman, but they translate from the Shanghai text. And uh, and uh, so that location is all familiar with to us. When the elbows flex, the point is in the depression about one since superior to olecranon. Okay. Well, obviously, ancient times they didn't call it the olecranon. What did they call it? Let's go back to the spiritual pivot. It says that special pivot, Sanjiao Ten, is in a depression above the big bone outside the elbow. Wait a minute. 
they're talking about a structure called the big bone that is outside the elbow. So if the elbow is the olecranine, then what the heck is the big bone? They're talking about two different bones. Right? That's information that is lost. All we have is just that it's behind the, behind the big bone. They're saying all I have is behind the olecranine. Is the, ele is the olecranine interpreted as the elbow or is the olecranine interpre interpreted as the big bone? Because they are, these are clearly different structures because one is outside the other. So that's um, that's the, see what over the generations how this information had been drifting. In the systematic classic, the only difference between the systematic classic and the spatial pivot in the 300 years is that they, they added the information of one swing behind the big bone. So we can see how this one swing would have been passed down to the current generation to retain this one swing information. Okay, but it still does not answer the question: What's the difference between the big bone and and the elbow? Okay, well. Again, think in terms of a, pro, a, a palpation based practitioner. If the elbow is olecranine, what would be a bony structure that's lateral to lateral to the, lateral to the elbow that would have been palpable? So it shouldn't be too hard to imagine that is most likely the lateral epicon, uh, uh, lateral epicondyle. So if that assumption is correct, then the systematic classic in this spiritual pivot is actually saying Sanjiao Ten is one sin behind the lateral epicondyle, not one sin superior or behind the olecranine. Okay, now let's see what the anatomy says. Okay, it's all fun and interesting to speculate, but at the end of the day, what does the anatomy, what does the actual human body tell us? This picture on the bottom right here is a picture, pa paper published 2006, and these surgeons were interested in finding out exactly where a very specific nerve called the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve, okay, the lab, sorry, my apologies, uh, the posterior antibrachial cutaneous nerve. They're interested in where this posterior antibrachial cutaneous nerve runs. The posterior antibrachial cutaneous nerve innervates the middle aspect of the dorsum of the forearm. So in a dermatome region that most acupuncturists would agree is the San Jiao um, uh, territory, okay? If you look at this picture on the bottom right, you see here, this is a lateral view of the elbow. This is the lateral malleolus, it's a lateral epicondyle, and this over here is the olecranine. These authors show very clearly that the PABCN, which stands for posterior antibrachial cutaneous nerve, exits the fascia above the lateral epicondyle. And if you take the location one sun above the lateral epicondyle, or the large bone that is lateral to the elbow, according to the classics, you are bang on the posterior antibrachial cutaneous nerve. And isn't it convenient for us that the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve innervates the dermatome that exactly satisfies San Jiao territory? So now we have now just the idea that the interpoints are innervated and co uh, trans uh, drifted, but we can actually demonstrate that the pre-drifted location actually has neurological relevance in the case here, the posterior antibrachial cutaneous nerve, and it actually is a cutaneous nerve that innervates what we call the sign gel in the arm. So this is a very, very convincing evidence that the ancient sages really were master anatomists. Okay. I'd like to finish up with um, this one here. Um, if you look at the picture on the top left side of the, of the cor uh, left corner of the slide, you see points sign gel five, six, seven, eight, and now. If I can direct your attention to the color photo on the bottom right here, we see a few very pretty colorful muscles, you know, in purple, yellow, green, and red. I ask the question, is it possible that when the ancients passed down the points six, seven, five, six, seven, eight, that they were actually trying to hint to us that these are the muscles to stimulate? Now, I implore you not to try to make sense of where you have learned the point with these anatomical pictures that I put up here because, first of all, this hand is in an honor deviated position. It put things out of alignment. Second of all, oftentimes anatomy drawings are imprecise. So th that's why there's a need to do some actual dissection. Mm -hmm. Love to show you the next slide here where I've done some dissection. And you can see that um, when the tendon of the extensive digitorum communis, that's the muscle that extends the fingers, has been cut and retracted, in the bottom picture over here, reflected, my apologies, we reveal the muscles that lie deep here. Okay, we have 
uh, it's harder to, unless you're familiar seeing this. Is, I'm going to have to help you out here. Uh, it's easier to look at the white bits. The white bits are the tendons. Okay, so there's a white bit here, white bit here, white bit here, white bit here. Those tendons correspond to, to um, their corresponding muscles. So the hypothesis is correct. In fact, um, Sanjiao six and Sanjiao eight innervate different muscles that lead to different tendons. Okay, and um, so it turns out the real reason why the Sanjiao channel does this level double 90 degree turn is to avoid the tendon of extensor digitorum communis. This way you get into the muscle beneath it on the lateral side and muscles beneath it on the medial side without having to go through the tendon of the uh, of the uh, extensor digitorum communis. I think that's kind of interesting too. They're actually trying to avoid these targets. Okay. Let's take a look at what happens if you stimulate these muscles. Okay. So uh, without going into too much detail, um, each one of these muscle points precisely match these very precise fine uh, motor movement muscles of the thumb. And uh, I've annotated for you here, Sanjiao 6 is extensor pollicis brevis, 7 is longest, and Sanjiao 8 is AB doctor pollicis longest. If we can have the video, we can very quickly see that these points are needle in the locations that any acupuncture students would agree is the location of Sanjiao 6, 7, and 8. And, but when we electrically simulate that, we get completely different types of range of motion with the thumb. Can I have the video, please? Okay, so when we stimulate it, now look at Sanjiao 8 here. Just don't worry about what the points are right now. Just look at the way the thumb is moving. This is when the thumb is moving to inside towards the screen, okay? is moving towards the screen. Then we have this needle here. What it's doing is that it's, it's moving toward us, outside, of, out of the screen, okay? And the next one here, Sanjo 6, is going to be moving to the left. Oh, sorry, the video has, uh, has looped, so we, we skipped over Sanjiao 6, but it'll come back. So this one here is 8, is going to the, into the screen. 7 is going towards us, outside, out of the screen. Okay, and then 6 should be going to the left. There it is. Okay, you see it moving towards the left. Okay, so it is pretty clear that the intention behind these points, Sanjiao 6, 7, 8, is very specific muscle targets. And unless you're aware of the anatomy, there's very good chance for, that you're going to miss these targets because these muscles are pretty, even when students know that they're supposed to hit these muscles, they still need to learn the palpation skills and, and the skills of, of precision and checking to know that actually these muscles. Okay, so move on to the next slide. I want to finish up with a case study using this, the, um, the information that uh, with the, the Sanjiao uh, seven, uh, 6, 7, 8 that I just talked about. It's a case of what's usually called mommy thumbs. Uh, mo new moms usually pick up babies from under the armpit, so they, are, they end up extending the thumb, which ends up irritating the tendon sheath of the muscles that extend the thumb. Um, so um, we have a 33-year-old female patient who's on mat leave for four months, and in the last six weeks develops pain in the base of the thumb. So, and um, this, of course, alerts you to the possibility that is a, a case of the Corbin tenosynovitis. And then, then the, bio, uh, the new uh, orthopedic assessment test to do this is the Finkelstein's test. And, um, and uh, according to biomedical literature, the tendons that are involved in the Corbin's is EPB, uh, pointing over here, get the arrow, EPB, which stands for extensor pollicis brevis, B for brevis, and the APL, which stands for AB doctor pollicis longus. Uh, so those those uh, abbreviations are listed for me here. So it's the one at the very base of the thumb, okay, and then the one that goes to the, uh, the proximal joint of the thumb. These two tendons, when the sheath is irritated, as a result of these two muscles being shortened and, and put, providing a pull and force on the tendon sheath, can create pain in this area. Okay, so knowing the having decoded which points correspond to which one of these muscles, I now have a way of precisely affecting the muscles that affect those particular tendons. 
So let me just briefly explain uh, the general thought process that I approach, um, um, uh, what I call the SMART approach. And SMART is basically an acronym to help you remember what points to do. Okay? So S stands for sensory, M for motor, A for autonomic, R for radiculopathy, and T for trigger. Okay? So let's talk about trigger first. This is where usually somebody, um, the source of the pain. Remember, trigger points refer pain, or what we call acid points. But where the, pain, where the location of the referral is usually not the place of the pain. In this case here, somebody has pain in the tendon sheath below the thumb, but that's not the origin of that pain. The origin of that pain is the muscles higher up, higher up in the wrist that contribute to those tendons. So what's that? What's what I mean by trigger or local? The local point is understanding what are the muscles. In this case, here is EPB and and APL. Now we have to choose some sensory points. It is a tradition in Chinese medicine, um, especially Chinese that like to use distal points. I usually use a a sensory nerve that is a derivative of this, the nerve that innervates the, the local muscle. So um, a little bit of anatomy understanding is required to know that the EPB and e APL are innervated by the deep radial nerve. So any nerve, any sensory nerve that's related to the radial nerve um, is a, a good choice of sensory, uh, of a distal sensory point. Okay? So it could be, for example, lung 7, it could be, for example, L, L, um, LI4. You'll, uh, you need to know a little bit of the nervous system that corresponds to each one of those points. Chinese medicine style, like, Chinese style acupuncture always, also like to talk about treating above and below. So the way I've interpreted that is that I, below I usually choose a sensory nerve target, whereas above I usually choose a motor nerve target. And this motor nerve eventually gives rise to the innervation of the actual muscle problem as well as the distal sensory point. So um, this is a way for us to integrate sensory motor um, aspect to the treatment. Okay, I know it's about pain, of course, but if the pain has a, has a muscular origin, you cannot neglect the motor aspect of that muscle. What about the autonomic? Um, in this chapter 74 is suing, they tell us that all pain, itch, and sores are due to the heart. So the heart we can interpret as a shen, so it's very effective if we can uh, calm the shen in, um, in the treatment of pain. And uh, so, uh, unfortunately, due to time limitation, we cannot go into too much detail, but usually the points that have the best effect of calming the shen are the ones that are, have a pro-parasympathetic uh, uh, aspect to their innovation, and these points are usually in the ear or in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the neck area. Okay. <laughs> Radiculopathy doesn't apply to this particular case, um, but if it was a, a case of a chronic problem, oftentimes there can be some radiculopathy, and we would co correspond that with the back shoot points and Hwato Jaji points. Okay. All right, so this is a general idea, and then let me move on to the next slide and show you um, how to put that strategy together. Um, I put down here in the slide for you um, the actual targets. So T, T could be, the T and SAR could be target or, or trigger, whichever you like. And we talked about side gel 6 and side gel 8 because those are the muscles that contribute to the tendon sheath inflammation in the corvins. We need to choose proximal points and distal points. So understanding the anatomy of the points allows us to select the proper nerve, and in this case, the posterior interosseous nerve, which corresponds to side gel 9. Okay? Let's select a distal sensory point. It could be lung 7. And um, in this case, it's the superior branch of the radial nerve is related to the deep radial nerve, also known, known as the posterior interosseous nerve. So this is an example. I know it's, I know it's a lot of anatomy and understanding, but it actually is re reconciliating the use of above and below um, distal points, um, acid point understanding. Okay. And I want to finish up with an example of, a, of an actual treatment. Uh, we have a video for this one, if we could um, pull up this video. So this is a, this is a new mom. Uh, um, I actually didn't know it's called a new um, mommy thumb, uh, but I did notice that a lot of my patients are new moms. And when I, when I searched for this, I was very happy to find that it's also known as a mom, uh, mommy thumb. Um, so what you're seeing here okay, is needles inserted into um, um, uh, Sanjiao 6, 7, and 8. Now, granted, these locations are a little bit more 
proximal than where you might, one might put those points. So the, but that's not the point. The point is you understand the intention behind the point. Once you understand the intention behind the point and you have the ability to palpate these muscles, you can put them anywhere in that muscle. Don't be so limited to thinking, oh, it has to be exactly two to the three to up. The purpose of this point is you know, it was likely passed down by the ancient sages to tell us, oh, be careful. There's a lot of points here, a lot of muscles here. Your intention might be clouded. I'm going to pass on these few points in here so to remind you that they are very distinct, at least four or five distinct structures in this area. If you know this intention, then you don't have to blindly follow the point location. Um, so in any case, um, the points over here, Li4 and um, uh, near the base of the thumb. These would be the distal sensory points I talked about. But that's the below of the above below treatment. The above here we have um, uh, Sanjiang 9, which happens to be the motor nerve that innervates um, the muscles that, that uh, work the thumb. Okay, so we satisfy above and below. We have sensory inter motor integration. We have local treatments. Okay, and we satisfy east and west at the same time using proper intentionality using very classical point location as opposed to modern point location. Okay. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, sorry for uh, taking a little bit longer than I thought. I get, when I get excited, I talk too much. So I'll shut up now, and, um, and um, I'll be happy to, uh, to uh, take any questions. Thank you very, very much, Pony. That was wonderful. Um, I love this, and it makes me excited to get into your courses that you have online. I will remind you, and stick around, guys, because I'm going to pause the recording in a moment just before questions to let you know about a special gift for everybody. Um, but just to remind you, Pony Chong has three online courses, um, basically what he's calling normal reading integrative acupuncture. He has one for lower extremities, he has one for upper extremities, and then he has a foundations course as well. And each one is 15 continuing education, so you've got an hour, and he's got uh, more there's one for 15, one for 13, one for 15. So what do we got? We got another uh, 43 hours of great material. So Pony, thank you very much. Um, so we're going to take questions in just a sec. So again, Pony, thank you very much for this informative lecture. Much appreciated. And we're going to take a few questions um, for you. And uh, again, reminding everybody that Pony has some great online courses on Pro-D. Pony also does hands-on training, so you can contact Pony Chung directly if you're interested in um, having him come to your city to teach um, and to organize a, a lecture. So Pony, first question is, how close to the nerve trunk are we aiming for in needling? Okay. Um, the, the purpose is actually not trying to pierce or puncture the nerve. Uh, first of all, we have to have a very good understanding of the anatomy of the nerve. Um, the nerves are actually very well protected by fascia called epineurium and perineurium. The goal, as you, as you may have heard these days, all, fascia is all the craze when it comes to meridian, um, biomedical interpret, interpretation of meridian, meridians these days. Um, by stimulating the fascia around the nerve, it's sufficient to cause a mechanical transduction that fires the nerve. We don't actually have to be hitting the nerve itself in order to create the effect. So, hope that answers your question. Close enough, but we just what we want is the paresthesia or, or dirty electrical sensation, you don't actually have to hit the nerve in order to get that sensation. Um, Lauren, should I just go to read along these questions? We'll answer the next one? Yeah, but let's read okay. them. What kind of yeah, let's read them. Okay. Next question is, what kind of stimulator are you using? Okay, so this is called a pointer plus device. Uh, there are a few various uh, versions available. Uh, so they're sort of like the... Um, the uh, the, uh, the basic version and the deluxe versions. Uh, all it is is a, is a combination of a point finder and a device to deliver electrons at 10 hertz. Okay? And, uh, and uh, oftentimes people would give themselves a treatment directly. Uh, this for, for laymen use this device to find points and then uh, and, and give themselves electrical therapy. Okay? I'm just using this device uh, not for finding points but for delivering electricity to confirm the location of points. Either by electrical sensation consistent with the dermatome, if it happens to be a sensory nerve, or reproducible range of motion, if it happens to be a, mus a motor nerve target. This is how I, how I call confirming, confirming and checking your de qi is actually correct. Next question. The point that we are going over mentioned near the pulsating blood vessel as part of the point location. Do you see this with many points? I remember in Camden you mentioned nerve innovation, but not in the way it's seen explained here. Uh, yes, I, su I, I, uh, I see uh, a lot of references of pulsation, pulsating vessels and 
And uh, if I can generalize, every time I see um, the pulsation vessel, it's a neurovascular bundle. So a nerve is right adjacent to it. Okay, and uh, so it um, and uh, it's uh, yes, it is different from what it's seen in the in the cam uh, because um, first of all, there are actually a lot of errors in cam. Uh, uh, and, I, and I'm, what I mean is that the, the Western innervations. Uh, if you look at my liver 8 and kidney 10 slides, they talk about uh, kidney 10 as being um, uh, um, medial femoral cutaneous. Medial, if you just think about where kidney 10 is located, even if it's the traditional, loca uh, the modern location, it's way in the back of the, of the knee. It's no longer near the medial femoral cutaneous zone. So even if the co location was correct, given the benefit of the doubt, the Western anatomy nerve that goes with it is, is wrong. Not to mention if the interpretation of the classic point is wrong to begin with, then there's no chance um, for you to reconcile the proper anatomy locations. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, most of the point locations are located along at a point where we might be going into nerve or pulsing vessel. Is there a risk of nerve damage in hematoma? I think I already answered that question. The purpose is not to go into the nerve. It's just goes close enough into the fascia. Mm -hmm. Uh, in order to cause electrical stimulation, uh, either manually um, or electrically. Um, the, uh, if you have proper uh, palpation skills, you will be able to feel the pulsation. And uh, I generally teach students to occlude the pulse with, by putting your thumb on the pulse. There, this way, uh, unless you want to needle directly through your thumb, there's no way you can accidentally needle that vessel anymore. We take the, the vessel out of play, so to speak. So to answer your question, no, there's no chance of hematoma. Tony, again, thank you very much. Everybody, thank you for your questions. We had a great group out. Again, I want to remind you that Pony has online courses for upper extremities, lower extremities, and the foundations. I know we'll be doing more with Prodia online and in person. And again, Pony, I just love the research you've done. I love how you you brought this together. And um, it, your courses are rich, so I know if anybody's going to register for these, you know, you've got lots of time to uh, review the material and really bring this into your practice. So again, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity, Lauren. Great. We'll see you again soon. And thank you guys, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your week.